Um, anyway, um, thank you for coming, and I hope that this is uh, beneficial to all who come. Um, right. I'll just get rid of this. Does the world need a designer? Uh, this is the structure of what I'm going to talk about uh, tonight. Um, so the, it's based on Richard Dawkins' book, The Blind Watchmaker, so I'm going to give a, an overview of that book, then a summary of its contents and uh, some of my review comments, uh, then make general comments about the issue of design, and then what are we to actually make of it and does the world uh, need a designer? And how about our attitude? How important is that in terms of the way in which we form opinions? Uh, first of all, the blind watchmaker. He wrote it in 1986, and uh, many consider it a classic work in this field. It's not an um, academic book. It's meant for the popular audience. And so he summarises his case for Darwinian evolution. Um, the chapters are listed here, explaining the very improbable, good design, accumulating small change, etc. And I'm going to give a brief summary initially for the contents of each of these chapters. This is the main theme of the book. Natural selection, the blind, unconscious, automatic process which Darwin discovered and which we now know is the explanation for the existence and apparently purposeful form of all life, has no purpose in mind. It has no mind and no mind's eye. It does not plan for the future. It has no vision, no foresight, no sight at all. If it can be said to play the role of a watchmaker in nature, it is the blind watchmaker, from page 14. So he is arguing that the design that we observe is only apparent. It is, so the apparent design in nature is actually an illusion. It's not really designed at all. And there is no need for a designer. Chapter one, explaining the very improbable. And I've got two slides, one on biology and physics, another the watchmaker analogy. This is a, a interesting comment that Richard Dawkins makes on page one. He says, biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. Physics is a study of simple things that do not tempt us to invoke design. Does that sound like a reasonable statement to you? No. Some, some, <laughs> some are nodding and some are shaking their head. <laughs> All right, so uh, having dismissed physics, is not containing any design. He then says, all we need to do is explain the design in bi biology and uh, we're done and dusted. So there's no need to consider design in physics. He starts with a classic statement from William Paley. William Paley wrote this in 1802. In crossing a heath, suppose I pitch my foot against a stone and were asked how the stone came to be there. I might possibly answer that for anything I knew to the contrary, it had lain there forever. Nor would it perhaps be very easy to show the absurdity of this answer. But su suppose I found a watch upon the ground and it should be inquired how the watch happened to be in that place. I should hardly think of the answer that I had been given, uh, I had before given, that for anything I knew the watch might have always been there. There must have existed at some time and at some place or other an artificer or artificers who formed the watch for the purpose which we find it actually to answer, who comprehended its construction and designed its use. Every indication of contrivance, every manifestation of design which existed in the watch exists in the work of nature with a difference on the side of nature of being greater or more and that in a degree which exceeds all computation. By William Paley, Natural Theology in 1802. So is this true? So he sets up the prior standard and then attempts to demolish it. Sorry. 
Chapter 2 is on good design, so he's giving examples of apparent design in nature and says, natural selection is the blind watchmaker. It is blind because it does not see ahead, it does not plan consequences and has no purpose in view. And yet the living results of natural selection overwhelmingly impress us with the appearance of design as if by a master watchmaker. They impress with us the illusion of design and planning. And he illustrates this apparent design, especially with um, echo location in bats. So bats can't see very well, they operate in the dark and so they use sound. And so they emit a tone and get an echo back and interpret that tone. And he describes how they do it. And he actually describes it very well. Uh, so I was quite impressed because acoustics is my field, <laughs> not his. Uh, and he describes how um, initially when they're just kind of um, surveying the background, they uh, give out little beeps, um, but their repetition rate is very slow. And, um, but then when they actually detect something, they home in and they go, their, their uh, cheap chirp rate or their pulse rate uh, increases as they actually get closer to the target, which is the right thing to do. And also, they don't just go beep, beep, like that. They use a chirp, they go whoop, whoop, whoop. Um, because the chirp actually gives them a lot more accurate estimate of the range of the target. So uh, these principles are used in uh, weapons, and we actually use it for our research as well. We use chirps to actually um, measure the speed of sound. Um, and uh, he gives an excellent description of it. and. Um, it's uh, well matched for his audience. So I was qu actually quite impressed. So uh, Richard Dawkins has quite a good understanding of acoustics and radar principles, and I was impressed. But he argues that the appearance of design is an illusion. Good design is produced by random mutation, and sorry, that should have been natural selection, not random selection, that's, a, that's very wrong. Um, mutation is random, natural selection is not. Then in um, chapter three, he gives the, uh, an illustration of how um, you can accumulate good designs through small changes. So random change alone will not produce good design. It must be combined with selection. And so he actually has a simulation of insect evolu uh, evolution in particular uh, he evolves ant shapes. So he actually wrote a computer program in BASIC and he introduced random changes or new branches in each step. And instead of actually using natural selection, he selected um, the variance by eye, uh, by his own intelligent judgment. <coughs> and he acknowledges that's not the uh, same as natural selection, but uh, he didn't want to wait around for millions of years before uh, he came up with an answer. So um, he actually, this re uh, radically reduces the number of steps. So he selected by eye. So he said that this is not typical, but it reduces the number of steps. And so he got an ant shape evolved in uh, just 24 steps. Um, all that's very interesting, um, but uh, <coughs> it's, in a sense, I thought he was shooting himself in the foot. Um, because he was actually uh, using a computer, uh, which is intelligently designed. The computer has an operating system on it, which is intelligently designed. And um, he programmed it. <laughs> and he had to write a very special program for the simulation to work. So this is actually analogous to the laws of uh, physics. The laws of physics are actually very special both in their nature and their fine tuning, um, so that living things can even exist, let alone evolve. So the intelligent, pro also the intelligent program um, is pretty poor comparison with the real world um, because it cannot evolve something that can either move or think. Uh, so you can actually run his program forever and a day, um, but the shapes that he evolves will never move and never think. 
and never be conscious. So the natural world that he thinks um, is there by chance um, is far more impressive than his program. So to actually get something that he um, can support or even evolve, um, things that can move, that can and think, uh, needs special infrastructure, which he did not provide. Chapter four, making tracks through animal space. If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. That's what Darwin said in The Origin of Species. And people uh, often argue that uh, some bits and pieces are irreducibly complex and there's actually no uh, incremental pathway to the final outcome. And this is often claimed of the eye, that the eye is irreducibly complex. So uh, Richard Dawkins discusses the fe feasibility of eye evolution by gradual change. And so he doesn't go back in the history, he looks at different species of animals that are uh, extant now and shows that um, their eyes um, show different levels of development. And so um, by showing that um, the, each of these species are incrementally different, that, that is analogous to uh, or a good argument for showing that eye evolution is uh, possible, that there is a uh, pathway of incremental changes uh, by which you could come uh, to uh, an elegant eye, such as a human eye. So that's a, a, an interesting argument. Next, the power in the archives. He starts off with this statement, this is the first liner, it is raining DNA outside. So each species is um, spreading their DNA and competing to propagate its own species. So this chapter mainly describes DNA, RNA replication. Uh, the information is held in DNA and copied onto RNA and mutations are rare copying errors uh, when uh, this copying process takes place. Uh, mutations can also be introduced by other means such as uh, X-rays or cosmic rays. Natural se selection is all about the differential success of rival DNA. Proteins are in, uh, assembled in accordance with RNA plans via ribosomes. ribosomes. So what actually happens is the DNA consists, I'm taking a big risk here because there's a biologist sitting in the audience. Um, <laughs> uh, DNA uh, consists of um, uh, base pairs or their nucleic acids and um, uh, each pair can be one of four combinations. So uh, A, G, C, T. Did I get that right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, each state of each uh, nucleic acid has uh, four possibilities. And these are organised into uh, groups of three. So you have three of these pairs. Um, so they're called a codon. And so the, the possible combinations in a codon are 64, which is four times four times four. And so um, these numbers can actually be used to represent amino acids. There's uh, 20 amino acids. And so what you have is uh, uh, a little Pac-Man goes along the uh, DNA molecule and it reads six successive uh, codons. And um, each codon tells it which amino acid to prepare. And so it um, constructs proteins. Uh, so the... Um, the little Pac-Man who runs along the uh, uh, DNA molecule uh, can gets the recipe for producing a protein by assembling a whole pile of amino acids. So how was that? RNA protein. Sorry, it's RNA, is it? RNA. Oh, okay. I failed. All right. <laughs> okay. So um, each cell 
is a gigantic chemical factory. You basically you've got machines within machines and factories within uh, factories. And when you learn about it, it's absolutely fantastic what goes on um, in the living world about the structure of DNA, uh, RNA, proteins, etc. Um, one of the things he states, uh, which is quite interesting, there's a particular gene called the H4 gene, which is very stable. Uh, so it's largely preserved even between peas and cows. So we have uh, uh, same. So you're saying that peas and cows have common ancestry, and it goes back to the H4 gene. And um, other genes are nowhere near as stable as the H4 gene. Um, perhaps it is because if you uh, the H4 gene probably represents a very good state. So if you if you change it in any way, it's disastrous. And so that's why it's actually remained the same over so many generations. Self-replication. This is an interesting statement. Self-replication is the basic ingredient of cumulative selection. There must somehow, as a consequence of the ordinary laws of physics, come into be uh, being self-copying entities, or as I shall call them, replicators. In modern life, this is filled almost entirely by DNA molecules but anything of which copies are made would do. We may suspect that the first replicators on the primitive Earth were not DNA molecules. It is unlikely that a fully fledged DNA molecule would spring into existence without the aid of other molecules that normally exist only in living cells. The first replicators were probably cruder and simpler than DNA, page 128. So note here, that Dawkins is assuming what he's trying to prove. He says, there must somehow, as a consequence of the ordinary laws of physics, come into self-being, etc. In support of his argument, he uh, gives an example of the Q-beta virus. The Q-beta virus does not have any DNA and uses RNA replication. However, uh, the Q-beta virus is parasitic on other beings that used DNA replication, so it wasn't a pathway to DNA replication. There has been ongoing research seeking uh, RNA self-replication uh, for origin of life studies called uh, abiogenesis, but it's been unsuccessful so far. So, a couple, a couple of notes on what he said. DNA replication and the operation of the cell are utterly amazing. and. Um, you could, you could spend many nights just on that. So there are many online vid videos which are well worth looking at. Um, but uh, Dawkins doesn't um, bring much to our attention the utter amazement of what goes on in the D DNA uh, replication. Um, anyway, there are stacks of online videos about it and they're well worth having a look. Uh, a very good source is the Khan Academy. Uh, so they're very much an education institution. And um, uh, so they probably do a lot better description of it than Richard Dawkins. But well, his description is pretty good. DNA, RNA, protein replication is a three-way chicken and egg problem. So which came first? Our, um, I'm an engineer, so I'm committing academic... Uh, trespassing, giving this talk, but I do have a, um, a consoling um, factor. My daughter um, did biology, and she um, did a or attempted a PhD in uh, microbiology. Uh, she didn't complete it, but um, th that's a big story. But she said in her studies when they described uh, the DNA, RNA, protein replication, she, her uh, comment was, how could anyone not believe in God when they see that? But that's the fact they do. So in chapter 6, um, it's called Origins and Miracles, and it's to deal with the issue of the origin of life, because uh, Darwinism uh, provides an explanation from the first cell onwards, um, but it doesn't give an explanation of the origin of the first cell. Um, so, uh, the topics I'm going to um, summarise are origin improbable on a single planet, 
and probability estimates, and his conclusion was that someone had to be lucky. The improbability of the origin. Cumulative selection explains development of life, but how did it get started? And he admits that the emergence of life is extremely improbable. However, with infinite time, anything is possible, except God, of course. Um, DNA, RNA, protein replication requires complicated machinery. So, and he compares it with a photocopier. A photocopier is not likely to emerge by chance. Uh, so he's saying, well, this tempts us to invoke God as the designer of uh, the DNA molecule. And here's his uh, great escape cause. But God must be more complex than DNA. Therefore, God is harder to explain than DNA. So God explains nothing. So what this means in uh, Richard Dawkins' eyes is you can multiply your improbabilities as much as you like, but you're just making God even more improbable so he doesn't enter the picture. So this is his big argument that overrides all naturalistic improbabilities. As a conclusion, he said, it is possible that our planet is the only one in the universe with life. He's got no way of proving it one way or the other, and he admits that. Uh, he personally suspects that there would be life on other planets, but he, he would also be unsurprised if that's not the case. And then he uh, attempts a probability estimate with the conclusion that somebody had to be lucky. So he assumes that the probability of intelligent life is the product of probability of life, times of probability of intelligence. And he comes up with a figure roughly of 10 to the minus the 20th per planet. He assumes atmospheric conditions are conducive to formation of organic compounds such as amino acids and purines. And he describes one particular theory for the origin of the first living cell, which is um, crystals in clay. And then claims, uh, and then the theory is that DNA came later and usurped the re replication role. Having described it, he admits that all these theories are speculative flights of fancy, but believes they are pre preferable to an improbable designer. Uh, and I've got a little note there, me, that's me, okay? So is it more prob uh, probable that there is another order of existence that has more explanatory power than naturalism? So um, he's saying, um, I'll go into that in a, a just a, a, that's suggestive at this stage. I'll go into it in more detail later. So all current theories are highly improbable, but life first appeared about one billion years after the origin of Earth. So there's plenty of time for the improbable to happen. So if you wait long enough, the improbable will happen. And he speculates that there might be 10 to the 20th power um, planets in the universe. So multiply that by 10 to the minus 20 and you get one. <laughs> okay? So therefore it is life likely that life arose somewhere in the universe. Constructive evolution. He counters the claim that natural selection can only be destroyed and never construct. Uh, selection subtracts... Um, but it selects the mutations that have added. So the mutations can add or subtract, and it selects the ones that add. So that's his argument. And that, that makes, to me, that makes sense. So evolution can be constructed by cooperative relationships uh, between genes within the species, and also uh, arms races between species. So he talks about cheetah and antelopes, <laughs> cheetah chase antelopes. So, uh, as a result, um, with evolutionary development, the cheetah runs faster and so does the antelope. Mm -hmm. Explosions and spirals. Um, this, it talks about uh, sexual evolution. So evolution um, favours reproduction. So that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to produce more offspring in the end. 
Uh, so that is the thing that will get your um, genetic footprint to dominate. So he talks about sexual selection. Um, a um, common example of this is the peacock, and with the male peacock, and it's pretty um, feathers to attract the female. And he thought that's a bit boring, it's been done so, so many times before. So he considered uh, tail lengths on a particular breed of bird, which I've forgotten. So, um, and he uh, shows how um, evolution can be rapid or explosive. So the l males with long tails will pass on long tails to their sons. Um, but if they have a daughter, the daughter doesn't have a long tail because it's not part of her business to attract females. So, uh, but the daughters inherit an unexpressed gene. So the females who prefer long tails pass on the preference to their daughters and the sons inherit an unexpressed, uh, an unexpressed preference. So even though that males pass on to males, males pass on to females and it pass on the desire for the long tail and also carries on to the sons. So this co uh, combination can cause explosive uh, evolution. And um, the sexual attraction is not necessarily the best option for keeping you alive. So if you've uh, got pretty colours, then you're liable to attract other uh, predators' attention as well. And so he says that there's actually an opt uh, optimum compromise between uh, utility, that's staying alive, and sexual attraction. Uh, chapter 9 is on the fossil record, and he calls it puncturing punctuationism. So he addresses the problem with the fossil record. Oh, sorry, this is my structure, uh, um, how he addresses the problem with the fo fossil record. Overview of paleontology, gaps in the fossil record, um, punctuated evolution, and how gaps are explained. First of all, paleontology. Paleontology is the study of fossils and is the only direct uh, evidence that we have of animals from the distant past. So only a small proportion of dead animals are fossilised and he's saying that this actually is an opportunity to falsify uh, evolution uh, because uh, evolution would be falsified if you had an incorrect order in the fossil record. Then he talks about dating fossils uh, so um, order is defined by level, so you assume that uh, the deeper they are in the ground, the older they are. And um, he says, if you actually had inversions, that would disprove it. But there are some um, things in the wrong order, and um, he says that they can be explained by geological factors, so that they are rare exceptions. Shell types can indicate relative rock ages, and also uh, age can be measured by... Um, uh, decay techniques such as potassium argon. However, it is well known that the uh, development of fossils in the fossil record is not smooth, it is jerky. So there are long periods where you get no change and then all of a sudden you get sudden change. So there are imperfections in the fossil uh, record and it's not what Darwin expected. He expected to see smooth change. In his own time, he only had uh, this jerky record in the fossil, um, in fossils, and he expected that as other people came along after him that they would actually find more records and it would smooth out. But in fact, it hasn't. Um, and it is so distinct that some people have had to actually modify uh, the theory of evolution. And this was done by a person called Stephen Jay Gould. And he's saying maybe the gaps are, re um, are real. And so he actually incorporated into his uh, theory of um, evolution. So instead of the gaps being a problem, he made it a feature. <laughs> All right. Um, an example of um, this um, problem in the fossil record is the Cambrian explosion. Because prior to that, 
there wasn't much around, and then all of a sudden, you had a huge appearance of a huge number of quite developed species. So advanced states appear suddenly. So is this a true gap in the uh, fossil record? Um, well, one way of getting around to it is to suggest that you can have, a, instead of small changes, that you can actually have big changes. So macro changes would actually um, explain these sudden changes in the fossil record. However, uh, Dawkins uh, rejects this, and he says that macro mutations can occur, but they are never beneficial. So they never help you. So um, a macro uh, mutation would not uh, have prolonged existence. You can actually get um, quite distinct changes in a single change. For instance, um, you can get extra vertebrae in a snake. Uh, so that can occur in uh, single steps, but he doesn't believe that this is a good explanation. He made, um, uh, quoted Fred Hoyle. Fred Hoyle was an atheist, uh, but um, he kind of had um, some doubts as he went along the way. And he actually made, came up with this um, uh, analogy that the likelihood of life emerging would be like a um, a wind blowing through a junkyard and forming a Boeing jet. And he's been widely criticised for saying such a naughty thing. Um, and um, um, uh, Richard Dawkins has a go at uh, Fred Hoyle, but um, it was misaimed uh, because uh, Fred Hoyle was actually referring to bi abiogenesis instead of uh, gaps in the foss fossil record. Anyway, Richard Dawkins has an attempt at explaining uh, how sudden changes can occur. Um, first of all, he defines what is a species, and he says that species are separate when they cannot interbreed. Um, and he can, says that speciation, so when um, a common species um, can develop separately and then not be able to interbreed, can occur by geographical separation. Uh, for instance, uh, um, geographical separation could occur uh, through a, a desert or a mountain range, I guess uh, could um, other means as well. And here's a theory that he actually proposes for showing how sudden changes can occur. So he, he says, imagine there's uh, one breed of birds and uh, they then split geographically into groups A and B. So then um, A and B uh, go through a process of evolution and they develop separately. Then imagine if so, for some reason the barrier was then removed and B uh, then was able to access the same geographic region as species A. So because B is better developed, it, it can suddenly wipe out A. So what we would see in the fossil record then would be that uh, a sudden jump from A to B in that region. All right, so you understand his logic? All right. Uh, all right, that sounds all right for that region. Uh, but wouldn't the fossil record in uh, B's region show continuous development? Um, so this scenario that he's proposing should actually be testable, but he didn't give any mention of a result, so I don't know what the answer is. Um, another explanation is that you can actually have long periods of st um, stasis, so that's no change, followed by short periods of rapid change. Um, anyway, there's two camps in the uh, um, evolutionary world, um, and they're, they're called punctu punctuationists and gradualists, and there's still tension between the two groups. Um, Comment. Stasis and sudden change does seem to be common because it's admitted by evolutionists, like Richard Dawkins admits that the um, fossil record is, um, is like that. Um, so, so what this means is this um, problem of gaps in the fossil record is not something invented by opponents of evolution because it's admitted by evolutionists. 
So the usual explanation um, of the gaps in the fossil records is as follows. Fossilisation is very rare, so most animals, when they die, don't leave any record behind. So the fossils that we have are widely separated snapshots. Change is uneven, so you, the chain, you may have long periods of change, then rapid change. Um, so, what that, so that, what that means is because you have a widely spaced snapshots, you may actually miss the change process because you've got it before and after. And so that's why you get a gap in the fossil record. Um, and there are also claims that there are examples which illustrate small evolutionary steps. So I don't know um, how true that is. On the Cambrian explosion, so you had the sudden appearance of species just as complex as current species. And this is actually still a major challenge to Neo-Darwinism. It's something that they haven't really come up with a solid, rock solid theory to explain it. So even though they have attempted uh, explanations of um, the nature of the fossil record, it seems that the fossil record is still not as expected considering that Dawkins is arguing for a slow, gradual change over eons of time. Um, chapter 10 is called The One True Tree of Life. It's on taxonomy, which is the science of classification. So, when you uh, have a library, the library has a catalogue of books and it puts them under different number systems and it attempts to classify them so you can search for a subject. But that is really hard to actually put a book in a well-defined slot because it can easily <laughs> be applicable to many slots. Um, so um, within the evolutionary uh, world, this shouldn't be a problem. Uh, there's um, a branch of taxonomy called cladistic taxonomy which is based on evolutionary uh, descent relationships. So the belief uh, of evolution is uh, that every two species will always have a common ancestor. So that gives you a method for actually classifying your species. So you classify them under common ancestors. So uh, closely related animals will have a common ancestor. And unlike books, this has a well-defined hierarchy. So it looks ideal. And if you can actually do this, then this is actually um, a good argument for evolutionary theory. You can show group things and show that they have a common ancestor. However, it can, can get fuzzy. And he goes into all the fuzziness associated with taxonomy. Sometimes you get errors due to convergence. Um, don't ask me what that means. Um, so, um, but the DNA dictionary is identical in all living species. So all living uh, creatures use DNA. Similarity in DNA indicates close and recent relationships and it allows, uh, supposedly allows, um, the, provides the ability to date the branching points. Um, la. Similar trees are derived from uh, different proteins. Now, um, there are many um, methods of doing taxonomy and uh, it's not as clear as it's hoped uh, and you, different branches give you different answers. So there's uh, two different types of taxonomy. One's called cladistic, which actually relies on the theory of evolution, and the other is non-cladistic. So um, with cladistic um, taxonomy, you trying to you're assuming what you're trying to prove. <laughs> you, so you're trying to retrofit uh, similarities to a branch in the tree. The non-cladistic uh, taxonomists uh, uh, say, let's not assume the evolutionary uh, theory. We'll just do taxonomy and see what results. <laughs> okay, so it is kind of more in independent uh, and a, a less circular way of verifying the tree of life. Chapter 11 is called Doomed Rivals. So uh, for Dawkins, uh, Darwinian evolution based, based on random mutation and natural selection 
is the gold standard by which we compare all other alternatives. And so he compares other theories, um, both naturalistic and a conscious designer. And uh, his conclusion is that only Darwinism uh, explains all the adaptive complexity. The first uh, naturalistic option he considers is Lamarckism. So Lamarck uh, lived from 1754 to 1829, so it's before the origin of species, which is 1859. So he preceded Darwinism. And his theory was that those parts that are used and grow bigger um, are passed on. So classic example is um, if a giraffe wants to uh, reach for high leaves, and if it exercises and gets a longer neck, then it will pass on the longer neck to its uh, progeny. Um, however, uh, this view has been rejected uh, because um, from observation, those sort of traits are not inherited. So if you do a whole pile of bodybuilding and develop all the muscles, you won't pass it on to your kids. They have to do the exercise too. Another objection is that bigger is not necessarily better. So a big lens is not necessarily a better lens for your eye. The shape is more critical than the size of the lens. Now there are other uh, alternatives to um, uh, Darwinism. Uh, I won't go into them unless I feel like it. Um, there's mutationism. It just, that just says mutations are more significant than uh, selection and downplays natural selection. Molecular drive. Uh, in molecular drive, uh, they're saying that the environment is more important than natural selection. So instead of the environment filtering out uh, the bad mutations, it's the mutations find an environment that suits it. <laughs> so it's just reversing it. Uh, but that's not considered tenable. Of course, the um, elephant in the room is uh, the conscious designer. So um, amongst those who believe in the conscious designer, there are those who believe in instantaneous creation um, or those who actually accept evolutionary uh, theory in a broad way um, but believe it's guided instead of unguided. So on guided evolution, he says you can't disprove it but it's superfluous, you don't need it. So also it assumes a complex God which is harder to explain. So his conclusion is that only Darwin is, explains evolution from primeval simplicity. That's his argument. So here are my general comments on the blind watchmaker. Um, the w blind watchmaker, as far as the way it's written, is not angry in tone. You get that in the God delusion. Also, when he uh, describes what William Paley believed, he doesn't ridicule the guy uh, because he um, admits that that was the best science for his time. So um, what William Paley did was fair enough because we weren't, didn't know what we now know. The book also contains lots of interesting information about biology, uh, so it's written well and a lot of it's quite informative, so I enjoyed reading most of it. So, but my major criticisms are as follows, and uh, I'm not the only person to make this note. Physics does tempt us to invoke design. So um, the statement he made that the laws of physics do not tempt us uh, to invoke design would now be considered ridiculous. Um, because uh, there's been a whole top, um, and he knows that by the time he gets to the God delusion. So. I think he might have regretted actually having said that. Um, I remember uh, when we went to school and we were learning about the structure of the um, atom doing basic chemistry, the model we got for um, a hydrogen atom was a positively charged proton with an electron circling it like a planet. If nature was actually like that, um, nature would not work. Um, because if you actually have a, a negative charge circulating a positive charge, um, it actually emits electromagnetic radiation. So it emits energy. 
So what we'd actually have is that the electron would collapse into the proton very quickly. So you'd um, never have any chemistry in the uh, whole universe would be dull. Um, instead, you have discrete energy levels and you also have quantum physics. So quantum physics is really crazy and we are weird, but it's absolutely necessary to get interesting outcomes. And there's a whole pile of laws of physics which are really weird, but nature has to be like that, otherwise we wouldn't be here. Another criticism is his evolution uh, simulations were developed by intelligence and yet are vastly inferior to what happens in the natural world. In many cases, his conclusions are not based on empirical evidence but are on ideological speculation. So uh, despite efforts to provide an explanation, the jerkiness of the fossil record is still a challenge. Um, he has an implicit faith in naturalism to co cover gaps in knowledge. So um, theists often get uh, criticised for using the God of the gaps. If you can't explain something, then saying God did it. All right, that's a valid criticism. But he works on the premise, if he has a gap, we currently don't know, but one day we'll find out. So you can actually say that to anything. <laughs> so that can be used to explain anything, and so it explains nothing. Probability calculations still say the origin of life is extremely improbable. It's far more improbable than what he says. And this is uh, illustrated by a book uh, called The Fifth Miracle by Paul Davies. So Fred Hoyle's Boeing from a junk analogy is still out. Um, un, um, also, uh, whether evolution is unguided or guided, or guided is untestable. It's a belief. Uh, now I might move on from the blind watchmaker and make some general comments. These on the nature of science, other links in the chain, can gradual incremental change produce elegant structures, other arguments for the existence of uh, God and Christian responses to evolutionary theory. First of all, the, on the nature of science, is science anti-God? What is the scientific mes method and is science pristine? Is science anti-God? The word science is actually uh, derived from the Latin word scientia, which means knowledge. So its ultimate aim is to get knowledge. Um, and science has a strong Christian roots. There's, so, there's a modern scientific method developed in the Christian West. So uh, a court, uh, you had the British Royal Science Society. The founding members of that were almost wholly Christian. And one of them was Francis Bacon. And he defined science as a study of secondary causes. So for him, the primary cause was God. And so but God um, constructed a universe in which there were laws, and we study his laws. So early scientists believed in an intervening God, and most of the great scientists were Christians. So you've got your examples. Uh, Copernicus was a priest. Galileo was persecuted by the church, but he still uh, expressed Christian beliefs. Kepler uh, defined uh, science as thinking God's thoughts after him. Isaac Newton wrote more on religion than he did uh, on Christi Christianity than he did on science. Michael Faraday was a, a member, a elder in the San Dominion Footwashers Church. I studied electrical, en electrical engineering and uh, the <laughs> major law from electrical engineering is V equals IR, volts equals current times resistance. If you know that, you can do electrical engineering. Um, the units of uh, voltage of, uh, um, are volts. U units of current are amps. The units of resistance are ohms. And these were named after Volta, Ampere, and Ohm, and they're all Christians. Uh, the th when you study mathematics, uh, you'll come across these names all the time. Euler, Gauss, Cauchy. They did a huge amount in maths. They're all Christians. James Clerk Maxwell developed the basic equations for electromagnetism. He was a Christian. Max Planck was a Christian. The scientific method. So the scientific method, the general principles are having a hypothesis, making observations, doing measurements, doing experiments, and then testing. 
And um, a feature, a true scientist is reserved. They are not dogmatic. They don't come out and say, this is fact, fact, fact. There is always doubt. So a, an academic ought to be cautious. The scientific method is also agnostic on God and the supernatural. It neither rules it in nor rules it out. Um, also, repeatable, testable, empirical science has far more reliability than forensic science. Evolutionary theory is basically forensic. It's not empirical. There's a lot about it that you can't test repeatedly. So many aspects of evolutionary theory are forensic or even speculative. So any conclusions that they make are less reliable compared with empirical science. Now, we have images of the white-coated scientists, pure like an angel. And there's many good things about scientific careers. Um, but uh, one, this comment is from my former supervisor and professor at uni. And he said, the first question with any research you should ask is who's paying for it? Because you get the answer you paid for. Um, and the, there are corrupting influences in science. So there's uh, competition for research funding. You also uh, measured your performance by how much you publish. And so there's a famous mantra within university environments, publish or perish. Um, so you, uh, you have to, there's competition for getting or retaining academic pos positions. Uh, also, academic in integrity is a big issue. And uh, um, I do research. And um, uh, we're working in a, a, a very small niche. We're the only people in the world doing it. If we fiddle the results, nobody's going to know. <laughs> um, and so, does it happen? Oh, I wouldn't be surprised if it's a bit more common than what you think. Also, if people go into uh, an area with uh, ideological bias, uh, you can pretty well guarantee that the results they came out with was what they believed when they went into it. So the scientific method is great, but it, can, it is open to corruption. So the white coat image doesn't mean that they're all angels. So don't necessarily trust everything you hear. Another comment about evolutionary theory, it is only one link in the chain. So evolutionary theory claims to provide an explanation of one aspect of design. Darwinism claims to explain the evolution of life. But it doesn't uh, explain other appearances of design, such as in the laws of physics. So what about the nature of the laws of physics? Uh, the finely tuned constants in the laws of physics. The finely tuned initial conditions in the state of the universe the origin of the first living cell, the origin of DNA, RNA, protein replication. Darwinism doesn't really address these issues at all. Um, naturalism. Naturalism is the, the belief that the natural world is all there is. But it has enormous improbabilities. Uh, there's improbabilities associated with the origin of the universe, the nature of the laws of physics, the fine tuning, the laws of physics, the constants, fine-tuning of the initial conditions, and the origin of cellular life and DNA replication uh, life cycle. So you've got extreme improbabilities associated with each one. To get the final in, uh, outcome, they cascade. You have to multiply all these improbabilities together. And so the final uh, outcome is fantastically improbable on a naturalistic worldview. Are naturalistic explanations realistic? And I'm going to cover a, a couple of topics. First of all, primarily, I've got a biologist sitting here, as you might get upset if I say this, but biologists in many ways are spectators. So biologists are nowhere near able to emulate what happens in nature. Um, they and can speculate over what happened in the past. When you actually watch a sporting event and you're a spectator, after a while you kind of get used to it, you get a bit critical. And I think myself when I watch a test match I think, and see people uh, bat, I think, 
that doesn't look all that hard. <laughs> um, and so when you watch a really good athlete, they make it look easy. And um, I had a, a, a go at sport and um, I could never um, get anywhere near um, elite level. I just didn't have the talent. And um, uh, so if I kind of worked at it, I could get uh, above average in a, uh, a sport if, just by working hard. But you come against players who are elite and there's just that uh, world of difference. And um, but so when you, when you actually watch them, it looks easy, but when you <laughs> try and emulate it, it's a lot harder. Um, so there, 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 I reckon there is this bit of a complex where uh, um, uh, biologists are spectators and they say oh, it's all easy when it's not. And this is illustrated in the inability to synthesize what happens in life. So uh, for instance, amino acid, uh, proteins are made out of amino acids and they can actually uh, synthesize amino uh, acids in, in the laboratory but they're mixed, uh, they uh, are left-handed and right-handed. Um, but there are 20 uh, amino acids, acid types in a protein, but they're all left-handed. <laughs> you have to actually make just left-handed um, amino acids uh, before you can actually form a protein. A typical protein molecule consists of around about 500 amino acids, and the smallest uh, have 100 amino acids. So far, uh, scientists can only synthesize proteins from other proteins. So they can talk about protein synthesis, but they have to start with a protein to synthesize another one. So they just modify it. So they cannot do it from scratch. So, um, so a protein is relatively very simple compared with DNA, RNA. So, uh, and then it's all packaged in a cell, and they consist of factories. So these are far more complicated and um, so, and um, the human beings are not within a bull's roar of being able to uh, synthesize any of these items from scratch. So is it reasonable to accept the claim that biogenesis happened by chance if the best brains can't come close to it? Um, this is kind of a, a, an engineer's view of things on elegant structures. Uh, so. It's assumed that elegant structures are the result of small random changes in natural selection. And DNA is a code, and the closest analogy is it, it, to it is software. So, does incremental change work in the software world? Um, incremental changes to software don't cause uh, an improvement in structure, they cause loss of structure and loss of elegance. So what happens in the so software world is um, you have a piece of software and you find a bug. So they raise a bug report, they repair the bug. Or they might want to inc uh, include a feature. So they do a change. But what actually happens to the software is it loses its structure, it doesn't improve its structure. And you have a, a thing called software bloat. And eventually the software grinds to halt, they chuck it out and start again. So the way to get around it I, is to do a process which is called refactoring, where some bright spark goes behind the manager's back and makes global changes to it to restore its structure. So um, elegance does not come by small inc incremental changes in the software world. You have to refactor. There's also system development. Large projects are always underestimated. And I used to work on the um, Collins class submarine and um, it used to get hammered by the advertiser and they were always picking holes in it. But actually it was a relatively successful project and the people who worked on it were fairly clever and um, also <laughs> oh, they might have gone 10, 20% over budget. That's remarkable <laughs> compared with uh, um, a lot of other projects. But the point is, uh, doing system development is harder than it looks. And if things can go wrong, they will. There's such a thing as Murphy's Law, and it seems very real. So tasks are always easy if someone else does it. So it is easy to observe, and speculation, it is much harder to do. So if you kind of, so what evolutionists or 
they can look at nature and say, oh, that happened easily, but they can't do it themselves. Another thing that impacts this whole discussion is ideology. So I'm going to talk about uh, various terms and uh, various ideological views. Ideological terms. I'm over time. Um, there's a term called scientism. So scientism claims that only scientific explanations provide reliable knowledge or that science can explain everything. So it excludes non-scientific fields such as philosophy or revelation. Um, problem is it's self-refuting. Uh, atheism is a belief that there is no God and is sometimes redefined as lack of belief in God to remove the onus of proof. Naturalism or materialism is a stronger form of atheism. It's the claim that the natural or material world is all that exists. Um, ideological bias. Necessarily we lack evidence in some areas. Naturalists cover this with ideological speculation and should we accept it? Here is a statement which is uh, quite outrageous but and for that reason it's been quite famous. It's called the divine foot and it's uh, uh, stated by Richard Lewontin. Lewontin. Our willingness to accept scientific claims that are against common sense is the key to an understanding of the real struggle between science and the supernatural. We take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfil many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for our unsubstantiated just-so stories. Because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. It is not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary that we are forced by a, our a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. Moreover, that materialism is absolute for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. The eminent Kant's, uh, Kant scholar Lewis Beck used to say that anyone who could believe in God could believe in anything. To appeal to an omnipotent deity is to allow that any mo at any moment the regularities of nature may be ruptured, that miracles may happen. Can you see what he's saying? He's saying that you have to actually rule uh, out the supernatural before you start. So here's some comments on the divine foot. This is an extreme statement. Not everybody holds it, but it is held by some. The supernatural is ruled out a priori. What does a priori mean? It means without evidence. So before you look at any evidence, you have to rule it out. So you can never get started. There's so no possible evidence can be used to support the supernatural. It equates science with naturalism or atheism or scientism. The struggle is between naturalism and the supernatural. And the supernatural. It's not between science and the supernatural. The struggle is between naturalism and the supernatural. So he's mixing his terms. Why should there be a struggle between science and the supernatural? Uh, people like Isaac Newton, he was a, uh, many consider he was the greatest of all scientists, but he was also believed in the supernatural. Shouldn't the primary goal be truth? rather than to shoehorn the answer. Seeking natural causes. Francis Bacon said that science is a study of secondary causes. He assumed that the primary cause is God. Naturalism has made the secondary causes to be the primary causes. Boundary between science and the supernatural. Science is still seeking natural um, explanations. For a theist, natural causes are not the total sum of all things. God, God ultimately sustains his creation and God can interview when God chooses. Close-mindedness. Close um, so if you Google, what would it take for Richard Dawkins to believe in God? This uh, link will come up. It's a discussion with Peter Bog Hossian. So uh, in which he states, I'm starting to think that nothing would make me believe which in a way goes against the grain. 
because I've always paid lip service to the view that a scientist should change his mind when evidence is forthcoming. So in this discussion, both Peter Boghossian and uh, Richard Dawkins virtually say that there's no possible evidence that would convince them that God exists. This is uh, Dawkins' big argument. Any God capable of intelligently designing something as complex as a DNA protein replicating machine must have been at least as complex and organised as that machine itself. Far more so if we suppose him additionally capable of such advanced functions as listening to prayers and forgiving sins. To explain the origin of the DNA protein machine by invoking a supernatural designer is to explain precisely nothing, for it leaves unexplained the origin of the designer. You have to say something like, God was always there. And if you allow yourself that kind of lazy way out, you might as well just say, DNA was always there, or life was always there, and be done with it. So according to uh, Richard Dawkins, God must be more improbable than any naturalistic explanation. Is this true? Anthony uh, Flew was uh, the most, one of the most famous atheists of the last century, and he considered this argument uh, to be absurd. Um, he said, God is a very simple concept to understand, which is uh, true, but is this a good response to Richard Dawkins? I'm, I'm not so sure. Here are my thoughts. Richard Dawkins assumes that God's complexity is analogous to physical complexity. He assumes that God is a physical being who is composed of parts. This world that we live in is extremely surprising. So over the last uh, 100 years, you've had things like quantum mechanics and uh, relativity. These are quite unintuitive concepts and are quite surprising part of reality. Um, but this is a contingent world. It is possible that there is one or more other orders of existence that transcend this world. They too could be even more surprising. So to me, it is more likely that there is a transcendent explanation that we do not understand than the extreme naturalistic improbabilities that we know are the case. Um, I'm going to skip this because I'm over time. Um, a quick thing on uh, Christian responses to evolutionary theory. Microevolution is generally accepted within most Christian views, but we have different Christian responses. So we... Um, have those who reject ma uh, macro evolutionary theory, such as uh, young earth creationists, and take a literal interpretation of Genesis chapters one and two. We ha also have the intelligent design uh, movement. They have broad acceptance of uh, the conventional scientific account, but have problems with full, the full evolutionary account and talk about irreducible complexity. Then you have those who have a broad acceptance of the macro evolutionary theory, they believe in an old earth and accept the development of life over millions of years. They have a different interpretation of the Bible, but they rejected the unguided adjective. They say it's guided. So this places us in a bit of a quandary. <laughs> All parties have experts who argue their position well. They often have an ide ideological agenda associated with their position. So this is for and against. Christians do not hold a unified position. And it's practically impossible to resolve the deadlock. Okay? So it's hard for a lay person to assess all the argument. So what can we make of this? What can I know? Who can I trust? Where should I stand? Does the world have a designer? So we'll look at some possible responses to this. The first one is the most popular. called apathy. <laughs> right, is that a good answer? Maybe not. Here's another one. Follow the crowd. Is that a good option? Not always. <laughs> um, this uh, photo is called The Man Who Did Not Salute. Who's seen it? Yeah. Um, the man, they believe, is Augustus Lundmesser. And um, um, I don't think he actually had strong ideological objections to um, Hitler, 
Um, he, the, his problem was he married a Jew. <laughs> um, and um, um, he paid for folding his arms. Um, he went into a concentration camp. Um, his wife went into, was um, gassed. Um, his two children survived. He was sent out onto the uh, front, poorly armed, uh, with a whole pile of rabble and they, on the Russian front, and he was killed in action. But he suffered because he was surrounded by idiots. Are you suggesting that's what happens to us if we don't agree with evolution? <laughs> well, I'm not saying it's probably a good idea to think independently of the crowd. Right. What do we know? Uh, the surprising laws of physics are necessary for interesting outcomes like us. The laws of physics are extraordinarily finely tuned. These are facts. The initial conditions in the universe are finely tuned. That's a fact. And living beings are fantastically impressive. When you actually think of all this DNA replication and cells dividing, it's going on in all of us right now. And if it went wrong, we'd die. <laughs> but we take it for granted. You weren't thinking about it before that, were you? Mm. All right. Also, there are other arguments for the existence of God, such as these. And we've gone through them in, in the past. I won't dwell on it because we're running late. So, who should I trust? Should you trust a campaigner for an ideological position? I'd say probably not. Now, I have a tasteless joke. My wife doesn't think this is funny. All right, once upon a time, there was a father and he had a son and he put out his son on the table and he held out his hands and said, jump. So his son jumped and he let him fall to the ground and said, let that be a lesson to you. Never trust anybody. All right, you didn't laugh, so you think it's tasteless too. Okay, fair enough. But I think that, that's the point. That, that's uh, in a way... The way I think, never trust anyone from the point of view. Um, ultimately, we are individually responsible for our own judgments and we cannot delegate to another. So what does the big picture tell us? That's the question we should ask. We should look at the big uh, picture and make a judgment. From a biblical perspective, this is what Paul says. Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and, oh, and their foolish hearts were darkened. So ultimately our belief is a choice that's based on our attitude. So Romans 1 makes a statement that God has made it plain. Is that true? But our reasoning can be darkened by a whole pile of not-so-hidden motives. Um, I actually believe that certainty is accessible to all, if you seek it. Um, and um, I remember talking to my mother-in-law one day about what I do here. And um, she um, is a, a fairly bright woman but she had limited opportunities for education. She only went for primary, uh, to primary school, which was typical of that day. So a lot of this stuff that we talk about is um, not really helpful to her. So she, she supports what I do, but she says um, that um, I don't need any of this because I've had experiences of God. And she described them to me. And she's in just as good an epistemic position as I am. So we are responsible for how we interpret what we see. And um, I sat under a minister for seven years in, while I was in Tasmania, and this is the only thing I can remember that he said. Um, <laughs> I just like that with sermons. So this is a saying by Dale Carnegie. He said, two men looked out from prison bars. One saw mud and the other saw stars. So it depends on what you want to focus on. Thank you. The, the, the person who chairs tends to get the prerogative to ask the first question. So I've got a few options here. Um, so I'll try my last one. Um, 
All of this may be infinitely improbable, or almost, uh, based on what you were saying, but we are here, so it did happen. What's wrong with that belief? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Parallel, yeah, universe, um, Parallel universe. You know, there's um, what's called um, um, uh, oh, somebody's given a story of um, uh, a man who is uh, doomed to die, and um, there were ten um, marksmen who were aiming, and uh, they said, "Ready, aim, fire," and uh, the, the Ten guns went off, and he was still there. They all missed. And he said, well, I guess that's not surprising, otherwise I wouldn't be here. Mm. Mm. Did I answer your question? No. Did he answer my question? No. <laughs> we, don't, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what was your question? Well, no, it's, uh, well, just, uh, it should, he should have been surprised that he was still there. <clears throat> so, uh, all right, we're here, we are here, but it is a surprising thing. But, uh, like... Um, um, I guess, like, um, it is improbable, but if you weren't there, you wouldn't know about it, would you? Of course, the underlying <laughs> assumption there that it is that it is possible, which hasn't been proven either. Yeah, there's this thing called Bayes' theorem, and if you actually look at it, um, uh, Bayes' theorem, you, uh, you can actually show that that's, that argument's quite a fallacy. Hmm. Right, I'm... Do you want to hear Bayes' theorem? <laughs> no, I have heard it, it's a bit messy. Yeah. Can you, can do, uh, does, all I say is that you can sometimes look at clouds and you might see something in the cloud, like for example a duck or a dog or something yeah. like that. Or it's you can go flying over Mars and you see this, a mountain with, with a face on it. That that's, would imply design in the cloud and in the other thing, would imply design. People would, might think that way, and yet we know that it's not designed. No. Not designed at all. No. So you could go on from that to look at um, stones, for example. Um, they cut, are, are different sort of shapes, like a foot and things of that sort. Mm. Nobody believes that that was designed, because mm. it's just the physics and it just happened to turn out that way. And you see pictures and match them as well, don't you? Pictures? We, we see things and we... And we kind of have, make the match ourselves to something that's similar. So, so it may but not be exactly. We, we recognise yeah, yeah, that yeah. as something mm. that we know about. Yeah, mm. yeah. and so we, we put the value on, on that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And um, then, then you, can, you look at um, the, the world around us and you see a mouse and you say, that's just the mouse, and you check him out, and he's got all these internal parts to him and everything else. And so we, we put another significance on that, and we consider that this is designed for a purpose. He eats cheese, and he does all sorts of things, and so he is designed for purpose. So his jaws are made for that, all his alimentary canals and everything else seem to have a purpose. Now, some, most people in history even all those, most of those scientists you mentioned are all Christian, but they, they had, according to Richard Dawkins, they had no choice. They had to believe in God. They had no choice. Everybody believed in God. There was no other explanation. And for the mouse, you would see that he was produced to work in the natural world and so on. And all those parts were there designed to do that. But he said, we now know after Darwin that that's not the case. The mouse has no purpose. It has no design. It has simply came up, come about by the natural processes around the place. Now, the fact that he turned out the way he is, we shouldn't look at that and say, well, how would he come from to get to get to that? Because nature didn't plan it. There was no purpose in it. All nature was doing was producing all sorts of different sorts of genes and DNA. And that DNA produced all sorts of proteins and produced different animals. But the evolution is not so much in the animal, but in the gene pool. Because it's the gene pool that is changing over time. And the mouse is, is an example of where we would be tempted to think that it is a, some sort of a designer. 
Whereas if we looked at all the parts, we'd see how they all work together, but they're a mechanical thing. And that this thing can evolve, change, just by gradual degrees to something functioning as a mouse. But in the meanwhile, billions of other attempts or to go in that direction die. Mm. So it's like you make all sorts of different things and you say, well, I'll grab this one. And or you, you look at them and they all compete with each other and one of them succeed or groups of them succeed and they have something which enables them to survive. Mm. And then you pass it on from generation to generation until you get something which is highly complex mm. and would therefore almost certainly, we would say, has to have a designer. Mm. And yet it's come about through a process of evolution and the genes that guide that are just chemicals. They have no personality, no ideas what they're doing. They're just doing things that produce something which has an effect on the outside world and produces all the complexity that we see. And so it's a bit of a discipline to be able to look at that mouse and say, this is not designed, this is an object, just like a stone, except very much more complex. And it can move about more dressed. That's I believe that's... The irreversible complexity sort of stuff. Sorry? That, that doesn't explain the irreversible complexity side of things, though, does it? You're saying irreducible complexity. Irreducible, yeah. yeah. Right, what's yeah. The Where does that come into? Oh, uh, from, uh, why well, are you saying that? I mean, it's a, um, it doesn't, that doesn't really explain that side yeah. of things. And Stephen Jay Gould's punctuated equilibrium. Things just suddenly appear. Um, yeah, but it, it, irreducible <coughs> complexity is like... Um, uh, saying, um, how, how can you get to an elegant structure? What Is there a feasible pathway to it? Yes. An irreducible complex, complexity is, is claimed there's no continuous pathway to that elegant design. Mm -hmm. That's what, I think that's a different thing, though. Yeah, yeah, I hear yeah, people yeah. saying that that's only apparent, it's not actual. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the irreducible complexity was something that intelligent design people say, um, that if you can have any organ in any body at all, that you cannot see the possibility of it developing from simpler and simpler and simpler forms. If that was not possible, then Charles Darwin said, this is how you can knock my theory on the head, mm. by finding such an organ. Now, there's been trials uh, to do with schools and getting um, evolu uh, evolution kicked out of schools and creation put into it. And the, they've had great studies, uh, great trials on that, where they had, in one case, eight creation scientists who were going to speak and show that these creatures, there's no such thing as irreducible complexity. That is, you can't have an organ that... Um, you can have organs, complex, that you can't break down and see how they would have developed. That's their argument. It's irreducibly complex. Mm -hmm. And of the eight, only three turned up at the, at the uh, trial because the day before the evolution, the evolutionists had had their say and impressed the pants off everybody with their education, with the evidence they had. And that's, they didn't, the creation scientists didn't say, this is why we're not going there, but a lot of people suspect it. So evolution, ev um, uh, er uh, irreversible complexity, I like the name actually. It's, it's an irreducible actually. Irreducible complexity mm -hmm. is a good name, but the irreducible complexity is, has not been proven by creation science. But I can't understand why someone would try to describe a whole organ or a whole organism in terms of irreducible complexity because as you so clearly uh, explained a few minutes ago, natural selection, mutation and natural selection can modify one organism into another over time and, and you, you, know, you described that process pretty well and so you don't Really, I, I don't see irreducible complexity in one type of mouse becoming another sort of mouse, or a mouse becoming a bat, or something like that, or a mouse becoming a you know chipmunk or another rodent. Um, what knocked my socks off when I went to uni and Still started is. studying intracellular organ, uh, not even organelles, because bacteria don't have organelles. What do you call them? Um, oh, ribosomes and DNA and you know proteins and all that. Um, that was where I saw the irreducible complexity. It wasn't uh, once you've got life, it's easy. It's just natural selection and mutation. You know, you're rolling. But it was from non-life to life that I couldn't 
and I still can't understand or believe that it happened by chance because um, a living cell is a different category of thing to a non-living thing. It's a, a mouse is different to a rock because a rock isn't alive and a mouse is, you know. Bacterium is alive and a rock isn't. Um, and, like Darwinism um, starts after you've got the cell. That's right. After you've got, after you've got a living cell, you're, as I say, you're, right, you're off and running. That's it's right. easy from then on, as far as I can see. Oh, except one of the... I'd like to describe more about this in maybe when I have a talk here. Um, there are some discontinuities that are very, very interesting between bacteria and eukaryotic cells and also a few different sorts of bacteria where it almost looks like life was created three or four times, or three times. Um, but, you know, apart from that, it's, um, it's pretty easy once you've got a living cell. You know, that, um, how do you explain? The discontinuities make sense when you look at the um, fossil record. Yeah. Like the tribalites and how on earth did it go from that stage to much more complex. Oh, well, they were crustaceans, weren't they? The trilobites? Yes. Like crabs and stuff? Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, um, no, I'm talking about the pure um, shells, the, the big yeah. shells that you find. Yeah, there was no other life, I don't think, at that time. Maybe. Oh, there were, there were sort of different sorts of life. Well, you know, you can have pretty major mutations. A, a creature like a fish or a snail, they make a lot of babies and the lucky one or half percent, whatever, survive. Mm -hmm. And so you, the mutation rate can be pretty high and every so often you'll get one that is more successful than its parents. Because yeah, they have so many offspring, you're tripping, tripping the dialogue. Well, what, what I'm really trying to say is this, is that it appears that there's a sudden change rather than yeah. a slow evolutionary change. Yeah. We haven't got the record of that evolutionary change. True. Yeah, sudden changes, <coughs> I, I don't know for sure, but you can have very sudden changes when the chromosomes break and then rejoin. You get things called translocations, and they, the... the um, the one bloodline then cannot breed with its cousins. Mm. You know, it's a it's a major separation, a biological separation. They're not mutually fertile anymore, and they can live and even mate uh, together, and they won't produce offspring. And then, like I said, it could just be lucky uh, chance, especially if it's a type of organism that has a lot of babies each generation, that they might be able to survive anyway, mm. despite this major major yeah. mutation mm. step. Um, Richard Dawkins is against <coughs> that major mutation, isn't he? Like he, he is against that punctuated evolution side of thing, that there's a big gap. Mm. Because, the reason he's against that is because evolution is not based on chance. It, there's, there is some chance at the beginning, but it's not primarily chance. In fact, he says it's the very opposite of chance. That's right. And if you're going to go from this to this, and that's a big jump, then you've got to have a whole lot of complex things coming together here yeah. to suddenly go there. And he says you can't do that. You just have slight changes, which it might be one chance in a million would happen, but that's still a, a one chance in a million. And that will change an animal just slightly. You may not even be able to see the difference, but there may be something to do with its body chemistry or something, its length or something of that sort. And then the next, that, those genes pass on and then it continues on. Now, where the gap comes in there, um, I think he says this, is that these all live in one big family, and suddenly there's one character who's a little bit better than everybody else. Mm -hmm. And so he starts breeding up, and his line of the family start having this gene and are better than the other line, and eventually the other line starves, dies out, and they're left now as a separate species. And they will then multiply over thousands of years and, and be highly pop, uh, sort of well represented in the fossil record. Whereas the others, that was only a matter of a thousand years or so. They, they were around, and so they're very scarce in the Yeah, but that's just natural record. selection. That's not where the that's difficulty the lies. It's natural selection, but that explains why you have the gap between yeah, but this that's not, one and but that. But that's not where the difficulty lies. I mean, that, everyone knows that natural selection works. We can do it to dogs in a, deliberately uh, within, mm. you know. Uh, Charles Darwin's, was his uncle, grandfather or something, used to breed pigeons, and he had pigeons all shapes and sizes and colours. So, you know, it's easy to, to modify an organism um, you know, once, as I say, once you've got a living organism, Only you're laughing. Only slightly. But if you're saying the punctuated evolution say that you go from here to there, a big jump, when they say that, then <coughs> you are relying on what's one chance in a thousand billion that that could happen. Yeah. And that's why it doesn't happen. It, yeah. But if you take it step by step, it will happen. But the reason the fossil record looks as if it's happened 
is because these only represent a small number. Oh, yeah. They died out. This lot here was successful and therefore their, their numbers is huge and are seen in the fossil record. I thought Roger's example was really brilliant well, when no, you said that you've that got two point. breeding populations that separate oh, and then one goes out. Well, yeah. sorry, you passed yeah. it on. But yeah. I mean, that yeah. was a really good way yeah. of describing how it could easily happen. Uh, there's, island, there's rivers, I think, in New Zealand where the fish or the uh, reptiles or something uh, got separated by a lava flow, you know, and then they can't, they, they didn't interbreed, and then, you know, they've, they've become different species in very short amount of time. I couldn't tell you how many years, but, you know, like a few centuries or something, and it looks as if they become separate species. Uh, so that's, I could just picture it, you know, if, if that lava flow then broke away and, you know, washed downstream or something, and they joined again. Yeah, if there was a major earthquake or something. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. So, so Phil, one of the, to, to take your point, one of the things that Dawkins says in, um, the, God, uh, in the God Delusion is he, he says we shouldn't think of evolution as going up the face of a cliff, mm. but actually we should think of it walking up the gentle slope of the back, which is yeah, consistent climbing with what you're saying. Probable, they call yeah. it. Yeah. But, but this intrigued me when I read it, and if I can get my question out, uh, if I can phrase my question direction, uh, it, it seems to propose that whether you go up that way or you come up the side, that there's a goal or there's a direction. Mm -hmm. And if there's a goal or direction to evolution, and evolution is supposed to be blind, doesn't that contradict the... No, no, he's not saying that there is a goal. He's just saying, like, um, um, the, the improvements survive. Well, well, I, OK, but hang on, improvement, where they actually... Uh, 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 come to pass on your DNA, you pass on your genes, mm. or uh, for survival, survivability. But if you look at uh, at um, uh, all of his right, and I haven't read his older books, and it's interesting the comment you made about it lacks the anger, because mm -hmm. the first one was before September, no, out of Eden, and um, and uh, this one was before September 11, right? Mm. Uh, which I think is, is sort of before, particularly. Yeah. Uh, so it was in April or May, was it? Sorry, it was in April or May. What? Just before September. September. Oh. Yeah. Um, but, but, he, but, and maybe I'm not phrasing it well, but we say that we've evolved further than chimps. Further to what? Mm. Like, if you're going to use the word further, or if you're going to use the word more evolved, that immediately suggests that you've got a presupposition no, that no. there's something you're evolving. So why have we not, even not evolved to the point that we're at, where we can have this discussion? Mm. That seems it's highly improbable. No, 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 no. This idea is um, Kevin was about to say. This idea of the mount improbable. The, I can remember now. He, he had the human eye up the top there, and how did the human eye get there? By lots of very big jumps up, and came all molecules came together all in one time, and it was just straight up into the eye. The chances of that are so remote that it's not happening. But if you go around the back, you can see pro slow progression. I, I, progression. Progress. Progress yeah, but towards only because what? you have the view that there is an eye up on there. You can't have a at, the time, at the time it was happening, the evolution had no idea what it was doing. It's just producing all and sorts of things, and billions of them died out along the way, and only those that could take the next step survived. Yeah, some talks of them about came an arms to race. The, sometimes, yeah. yeah. Sometimes, yeah. yeah. Sometimes, mm -hmm. some of them came to a rock, but they couldn't get off. So they still, they're still there with an eye that's like a pinhole camera. So that means, that implies to me, that if our purpose is to pass on our genes, why in the hell are we worried about conservation? We should be worried about our genes, our genes only, mm. and it doesn't. And 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 frankly, if every other species, apart from those that we need for food and energy, that's all we got to worry about. That's yeah, but the what we now, we now that. know that we need the other creatures to pass our genes on. If the other creatures weren't there, then your grandchildren are not going to survive. Yeah, but plenty have already gone extinct, and we're still here. Yeah. So yeah. plenty have already gone extinct, and we're still here. So why do we need all these others that yeah. haven't yet gone? Let's just extinct. keep the ones that are for food. Yeah. I don't understand that. I don't understand your answer because there's a lot more things besides simple creatures where you rely on. That's the things you can't see, like bacteria, organisms, mm. stuff yeah, like the, that. Yeah, the whole ecology and, 
You're saying, why do we bother about all the other creatures, whether they're bacteria or so elephants or anything else? If you're going to destroy the earth, you'll destroy yourself in the bench. Uh, that's right. So and that's, we can and figure figure out. Out. We've evolved to a point where we can figure out no, which we ones can't. we need. We don't. No, we can't. If you, that, you're, a, you're a fool if you think that, honestly. Mm. All right, let me try it another way. Do we need dodos? How in the heck, no. how in the heck do you explain in a directionless, and I guess this is one of the, this is one of the questions, um, how do you uh, uh, how do you uh, explain us to our level of consciousness and our ability to be able to have this conversation on a purposeless, directionless, directionless being the key thing um, uh, system? I, I um, the answer is I don't know, and the answer that I've got is that I don't see any difference between a theist and an atheist. Because neither can explain anything. No, no, but no, we're just talking about evolution. No, but it's right? the same thing. No, it's the same thing. I'm not offering a different because solution. Because you're, you're sort of saying there's a purpose. You, so you, I'm, I'm now going back to your ultimate question, which is yeah. that there's a purpose. Okay, that's where you're coming from. I'm and posing that for no. atheism. I'm not posing an answer at this stage. I'm no, just no, no, I'm, I'm saying mate. to mm. me there's no difference between an atheist and a theist. An atheist says there's nothing. A theist says there's a God. Neither can explain satisfactory to my mind either. Uh, okay, so okay. therefore the fact that there is an apparent direction. No, is that and, and no, you can't. You can't prove that there's an apparent direction either. We're here. No, so what? So what? Well, because because I, I, if, I am. I'm, if, if, I'm, a, if a direction I towards exist. increased complexity wasn't somehow coming out of the model, right? If some if somehow increased complexity was not coming, and somehow inherent in evolution. And evolution, I have no problem with as a means, right? Um, uh, if there wasn't some sort of direction, we wouldn't be here. If, if so facto, we're here. Yeah, you know, but, see, we wouldn't be here. but the world says. Uh, wouldn't be here sitting, having yeah. a philosophical discussion. That's the. I, I agree. Yeah, I, I, I sort of agree, but, but I. But I'm just but saying, how do you know that we, we wouldn't be here unless it was planned? How do you know that variations in. In, in the organisms that come along, going in any old direction, nature chooses which one's going to survive nature and which chooses, one's survive. Sorry, you've just, think, you've just that's now... That's just human beings. That's just okay. that's survival. survival. What do you mean? Survival. 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 It's a figure of speech. But look, how does sitting here yeah. having this conversation help you pass your DNA on? I haven't passed my DNA on, on to anyone, thank God, because it's, it's wonky. So, um, <laughs> but, but, I, but here, I'm far more intelligent than I, than I would have needed to to have kids. You, are, we are all far more intelligent than, than uh, we, we had enough survival value with much less intelligence than we've got. And why did that extra level the, the one explanation? Develop? And is that what you're trying to get at, Tom? That we're far too smart for our good, for our for our needs. I think that's a, I think that's a part of the reason I'm asking the question. Yeah, I is so. because it's not only a question of design. You said there's apparent design, but there's apparent direction. And directionality, which I think we don't do the same sort of analysis that you, the wonderful analysis you've done on the design, the apparent design. There's apparent direction, and Dawkins says it. He talks about the direction of walking up the slope, and we're not it even looking it's at not, that. It's, yeah, it's not survival. Stage. That's what I'm saying. We're, we're far too yeah, smart what's so for important what about was survival? needed. But we're we're survival. the product of an arms war, an arms race. The ones who are left we're, are the ones who survive. We yeah, got gradually smarter, and then we were in competition with each other. Yeah. And get smarter and smarter. But we didn't have to be this smart. What? We don't just have yes, kids. Yes, but but uh, the people that make design jumps. Do you think the smart, one, think the smart one is actually survive in a human society? If you think about it, is the one is the top top one of the um, the out of the kings and queen. Do they survive within the uh, social circumstances? Mm. Most of them, the, the one who suffered from not able to pass on the genes is those kings and queens. And uh, look at those peasants. They have uh, lots of children. And they're the ones who <laughs> end up having us as the ordinary people develop the next generation. Yeah, so um, is that the, like, a, to me, it's like a, the God word saying, humble will get. Yeah. And then that's the one. It's just the humble one. Is that one is sort of get next generation, and then the one who is, you know, maybe yeah. king and queen that time, but they sacrifice their life for the. But are we slightly <laughs> arrogant at this time that we think we know everything, and that we're the ultimate? When 
the biological, sorry, the history of the Earth says that creatures come and go and are wiped out. Could could we not? You know, are we? Um, will, will, will we be wiped out and the and the insects come again and it all starts again? And if so, will it matter? Hmm? And no, if no, so, will it matter? Right. I don't know. My answer is I don't know. The king <laughs> and why hasn't that happened are? by now? And I know Stephen Jay Gould's got you know unless we're, we're benefactors of the of the of an asteroid and by hook or by crook you know mostly by crook we beat out the Neanderthals and stuff like that. Mm. And I think that's a really valid question. But why hasn't it happened now? There's been a few. No, 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 no not even now. I mean, um, uh, in a few million years or a, even a few thousand years that. Um, the Earth gets t- so hot that we can't survive, but some other creatures can. Mm. Mm. Okay. And then on the, on the issue of intelligence, is, is, does intelligence help survivability? Only up to a level, and yes, we're, exactly so right. we're far exceeded that level. I remember reading but, an but, article... But you've, if you look at human history, yes. there's um, warfare right, between... Yeah. Yeah. And um, uh, the, the smarter ones win the war. Yeah, <laughs> I reckon true. the total yeah. mass of ants on the Earth exceeds the total mass of humans. Let alone numbers. <laughs> there was an article I read about 10 years ago, so I can't remember it properly. And this guy was, uh, he was actually a Christian and, and using it as evidence for the existence of God. And he said that humans are capable of, I think it was fifth, le- fifth level thinking. So I think first level is I know what I think. And uh, then I listen to you and I can work out what you think. And then I try to work out what you think I think. Yeah. What, you, what you're making of what I say. So that's right. third level. And then he, he could, I don't forget how he explained it, but there's fourth and fifth. Levels of, oh, of yeah. complexity that you need to offer to use to so cope with a social group, yeah. <laughs> you know, that, like, to manage a social group. But it, it was something also that it only mm. really operated, humans are designed to work with uh, social groups of up to 150 close friends and relatives. Some, I can't remember, like I said, it's 10, mm. 10 or 15 years ago, I can't remember it properly. And he said, but however, they can show that humans can think at five levels, and he said that fifth level is only for working out what God thinks of us. Something like that. It was, I, I'm giving a very hashed up version of it. I must say, it was on the ABC Science site. And I don't know if I'd be able to find it again if someone wanted, wanted me to. But um, I, uh, that just impressed me at the time. And I, I'll never forget realising that we're more intelligent than we need to just to survive. And that's what this guy was saying. That we don't need that fifth level mm-hmm. of, of complexity. You know, if you're, re- if you're watching an Agatha Christie movie or a reading of one of her novels, there's some, people, some of the clues that are given are misinformation. Mm-hmm. And the, the answer to the puzzle of uh, who did who done it is to work out who gave you that wrong information. And that's that level of complexity of, mm-hmm. they, okay, that's what they're saying, that's what I hear them say, but is it actually true? Mm-hmm. So it's, it, that's the sort of four higher orders of thinking that you have to go through in order to come to... The so you're saying we have abilities that don't have any survival value? Exactly. We have mental abilities, but do you say, orders of thinking. I, I can't... I'm only passing on what I read this guy was writing about. Julie, Julie what, what in, is there in nature that would decide that we can't be as smart as we are? No, just that you don't need to be. To no, 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 but, but what in nature would say that we can't be as smart as we are? That we, we, don't, we, we can only be as smart as we need to be? Well, what yeah. in nature is there that says well, that? Well, see, um, I don't know if you realise this, but a fifth of my energy levels and a fifth of my blood supply is going to my, uh, my brain and your brain. Mm-hmm. It takes a quarter of our calories to run our brains, mm-hmm. and that is a huge drain on resources. And so if we're running a bigger brain than is needed to have maximum number of babies, mm-hmm. we are running at a disadvantage compared to a slightly dumber person who has the same number of babies or even more <laughs> uh, without having to waste so many calories running this huge machine. Albert Einstein had an average size brain. Yeah. Yeah, but even I'm talking average sized brains, use a quarter of your calories and your and like, like blood supply, oxygen supply, our resources are running a much bigger computer than we need. It doesn't make sense. Smart, Evolution like, really doesn't Albert make Einstein sense. Albert Einstein with an ordinary brain. Yeah. It's got to do with complexity. Mm. So, because yeah. you see a moral yeah. emerging, I think it's dumb no. to have children. <laughs> 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 the only question I have is I'll like, like a, I always sort of like a, it puzzles me business. and it interests me. Like a God said, like a, the first day, you know, he created yeah. the light and darkness and separated. And then the and then day and night. And then that day and night, that, that's the, he's stating that's the, the time frame, that time frame. Isn't that, that sort of like, it's almost like that, what you're talking about, the big evolution and then those things, physicality thing, physical things happen that time, 
but that the little... I think, I that, think the that. idea is that uh, in the good old days, mm -hmm. when I went to Sunday school, it was six days and it was in that little frame. Everything happened in those, that frame. Mm -hmm. But now science has come along and mucked that up. And it's saying <laughs> that it's taken hundreds of millions of years for things to happen. Yeah, yeah. And so the, the theology, theologian play a little game called hide the theology. So when you bring it up now in groups of people, they hide the theology that, were, that they used to say. And they say, well, we've always thought that day was sort of a, a vague term, like the day is of, uh, of Solomon or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they can fit all sorts of things in. And they used to say a thousand years is a day and a day is a thousand years to the Lord. Then when they found out it wasn't thousands of years but hundreds of millions of years, it was pushing it a bit. So they hide the theology. They never tell you about it. Can I, can I? Can I say, that's, that's, that can I say something that uh, Kevin like alluded to? Yeah. What about the chip don't have children? No, no, you, you actually raised it quite well. Um, you said there's four interpretations, and I can't remember them exactly, about where you position. It's actually your choice. You've chosen to take that view. You've taken taken that view. I've got a different view mm -hmm. than you, and we all got different. We're all coming from different perspectives, and so we're in those four camps that you described are actually pretty well described most mm -hmm. of us. We're in one of those camps, and, and I'm in a different camp than you. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. The no, no, I think we are. Tom doesn't I think, do are. I think the arguments would say that you have a different, um, you have a, uh, a designer type view. I'm in the, I would put myself in the fourth group, for example. Which is all? Um, I think it's I. I, 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 I think all, all of them have an art, all of them have a point, but none of them have got. The total answer. That's, I think that's, that was my interpretation. Do you agree there is an answer and there is a truth? No. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. Good answer. I think there is, but I don't think we'll ever know. Uh, that's what uh, I'm trying to say. I hope one totally. day we will. So oh, yeah, sorry, while we're alive. Yeah, yeah. yeah so I, I don't believe that we can all have that. And you can only. Yeah, we are. No, 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 but I'm saying that we have a fundamental difference of how we look at it. Well, we're a little bit over time yeah. already, no, so obviously we do. going to have to stop, but I'm, since I'm chairing at the moment, I'm going to take advantage of that and have the final say. Can I have the second last thing? Oh, you can have the second one. Do you want to have the last one after I have the second last thing? No, I'll, 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 I'll just point out and you can come up. Um, um, the elephant in the room is... Uh, sorry? I had one burning question. I mean, right. Shall we let it... Yeah, yeah. Go, go. go. My, my question was, imagine, and I wanted your opinion, Kevin, because you're the one that did this thing, um, yeah, better. Um, I said I was thinking. Imagine that somehow or other, it was proved. Right? It was proved that evolution, Darwinism, whatever, could prove that we started from a microbe and ended up with humans. Right? Imagine that it could be proved. Don't don't ask yeah. me that. So what? What would that do to mm. faith in in, in Did you say prove that it could happen or prove that it did happen? Sorry. Do you say prove that it could happen or prove that it did, did happen? happen? Prove that it did prove happen. Prove that it did happen. I'm saying yeah. irrefutable mm. scientific mm. proof. They got a whole lot of microbes, mm. they put them in a the thing and they watched and they went, ooh, ooh, ooh. They found the fossils, they, I mean, whatever. Yeah. I'm saying, imagine that it could be proved and everyone thought, we got it. It can happen. You can go from microbe to human and it all, it's all, it, so what? What would happen to the Christian faith? Would it be going, hmm? Well, personally, well, um, I, I presented stuff. I presented uh, kind of different aspects, but I didn't come out and dogmatically say what I believe, and I uh, because I don't know. And um, um, if it is, I'm not saying that that scenario is not true. But that's not a question. Mm -hmm. But how does it affect me? Um, I I can still accept that uh, God was working through that because I I can actually see. Um, all those other design aspects and the laws of physics, etc. So, so that, would, that is how I would see it anyway. Meaning, yeah. meaning, in my opinion, even if it was proven, it would not in itself prove that there isn't a God. Yeah. 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 And it wouldn't prove there is. That's mm -hmm. right. That was my point. That yeah. I don't see any difference between an atheist and a theist. Mm. Not, not because to say you're starting from that one starting point, yeah. and nobody can prove one way or the other, as you rightly say. Yeah, I think people are overly opinion. dogmatic in the area, yeah. and um, I think um, <coughs> academic reserve is a, a good thing. Yeah. That you actually uh, admit that you don't know uh, these things for certain, um, because we just don't have enough evidence, or uh, don't have the opportunity to <laughs> find out, etc. So, um, I mean, you don't know. <laughs> Can I ask you a question?
question, if you don't mind, and if you want to be quiet, I will. have to be very quick. But to, to answer your question from my point of view, my point of view is I was brought up to believe the Bible is the Word of God. I go to church and they read out from the, from the pulpit what Isaiah said, this is the Word of the Lord. Everybody Thanks does it. <laughs> After a big cup of tea and biggies, not many people believe that, but they still say, this is the word of the Lord. That shows me that that's what people believed in the past. And where I think the answer, what is to me the important thing, is if the first chapter of Genesis says, and the first day this happened, the third day this happened, all the critters came on the fourth and the fifth and the sixth day, and they were days the sun come up, the sun went down, then I'd have to, you'd have to need a pretty good reason not to say that that's a 12-hour day or at least a 24-hour day. And if you can show that the man evolved or fought from in, um, microbes to human beings and that it didn't follow what the Bible says, then that would show that the Bible is not the Word of God. Not the Word of God who, who speaks the truth. And that's how it would affect my belief. And I, I believe it affects other people, but we're playing hide the theology. Kevin, the second to ask? Um, yeah, I'd just like to point out that Phil is the elephant in the room. <laughs> this, this, this topic was um, his suggestion. Um, and um, so, and he caused me all this pain of having to do so much preparation. <laughs> <laughs> and we do appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> and what is worse, he tells me he has another suggestion. <laughs> I don't know what it is yet, but I'm, I'm waiting with bated breath. Well, you did a really good job. <laughs> yeah. 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 So anyway, thank you for suggesting the topic, and I think it's generated. Well, thanks yeah. for giving it to us, yeah. but you did an excellent yeah. job. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My final point, um, part of this was said by Julie earlier, um, mutation. Um, mutation only ad, acts by altering something that already exists. So therefore that implies there had to be something in the first place for mutation to act upon. And where did that come from is one question to consider. And the other question is also, if mutation only acts by acting on what already exists, it doesn't, there's no way for new information to be added. It can only alter the existing information or subtract information. So where does new information come from? Oh, yeah. I don't think there's a time to really no. discuss so, it. This question is to leave with you. No, no time to discuss that one. <laughs> um.